Hello and welcome once again to your questions. Today we will be looking at the video questions coming through Africa at MTA.tv on the rights of women, that is wives, over husband's money and interest in Islam as well as do Ahmadis believe, whether Ahmadis believe or not, that Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, is the last prophet. Stay with us. Don't change the dial. And please keep your questions coming through. Africa at mta.tv. I remain Ibrahim K. Asante, your host. Join me. Welcome once again to your questions with me today to discuss your questions. That's the questions sent through by the video messages uh, all the way from Uganda, Ghana, and Tanzania is Faraz Yassin Rabani, who is a qualified missionary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Welcome, sir, to your questions. Well, let's go straight into the questions. The very first question is coming all the way from Ghana. And uh, let's listen to the question and then let's see how we take it on. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. My name is Hiba Farouk and my question is, as other Muslims believe that the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is our last prophet, do Ahmadis believe the same? Thank you. So, Faraz, do Ahmadis believe that uh, Prophet Muhammad may the peace and blessings of Allah, God, be upon him, is the last prophet, Khatam Nabi, in the seal of all prophets? A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Asante Sahib, this is a question that has been posed again and again to the Jamaat in different ways. Sometimes they when you say, say the Jamaat, what do you mean? By Jamaat, I mean the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Community, thank you. So this question has been posed, sometimes they say, or it's alleged that this community does not believe in the Holy Prophet on whom be peace, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at all. And then sometimes this question is posed that do we accept him to be the last prophet? But when we look at this question from practice and theory, do the non Ahmadi Muslims believe that he is the last prophet? Though by their words they believe that the Holy Prophet وسلم, and they translate Khatam al Nabiyin to mean the last of the prophets, but in creed and in theory they believe that Jesus Christ is going to come again and he is going to be the last prophet, not the Holy Prophet وسلم, because he is coming after the advent of the Holy Prophet. وسلم. This bone of contention comes from the verse of the Holy Quran, Surah Al Ahzab which reads as, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَاكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ So the first portion of the verse is, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّنْ رِجَالِكُمْ That Muhammad وسلم, is not the father of any of you men. وَلَاكِنْ But, وَلَاكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ He is the prophet of Allah وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ And the khatam of the prophets. Now, when we look at this question, even from the linguistic point of view, that Allah on one side is saying that he is not the father of any of you men, but a prophet of God and the last prophet. This does not go in harmony with the first statement because in the Arabian society, a person who was not having a male son was regarded as a person of no value or of, not a, of a good class. So the Allah the Almighty is rejecting this point of view by saying that he is not the father of only a few men but a prophet of God and not only a prophet of God but the khatam of the prophets. Now translate as khatam to mean last and what superiority is the Holy Prophet getting out of it? When we look at the linguistics of, of, Arab, of the Arabic language we see that this word khatam has been used with a group of people. For example it is written about Abu Tamam that khatam is shu'ara who is Abu Tamam? Abu Tamam was a poet, a very eloquent one. And the books of Arabic write him as Khatam al Shu'ara. That means he is the Khatam of the Shu'ara. Now, if you translate Khatam. What's, what's Khatam? Yeah. yeah, Khatam 
uh, if you translate Khatam to mean last, then do you mean there were no poets after Abu Tamam who died centuries ago? That's not the meaning. It means he is the best of them. Then the Holy Prophet told, told Hazrat Ali that he is Khatamul Awliya, the Khatam of the Awliya. Now translate Khatam to mean last. What's the Awliya? Awliya means the friends of God. So if you translate Awliya Khatam to mean last, so are you trying to tell us that Khatamul Awliya means Hazrat Ali, who came a thousand four hundred years ago, was the last man of God on this earth? It's not possible. Then we have about Khatam al Hufaz. It is written about Ibn Hajar Askalani, Rahimahullah, that he was Khatam al Hufaz. Hufaz means a people of group who have memorized the Holy Quran offhead. So if you tell us that Khatam al Hufaz means the last of the Hufaz, this is against history and against facts because we see so many Hufaz, people who have memorized the Holy Quran. So this terminology was used in the Arabic language to mean the best of that group. So Khatam al Shu'ara, the, the best of the poets. Khatamul Awliya, the best of the men of God. Khatamul Atibba, the best of the, med of the medical doctors. So this was a term that was used in Arabic, in ancient Arabic language, and in today as well it's being used. But the problem and the irony is when we talk about Khatamul Nabiyyin, they want to translate that to mean the last of the prophets. And they forget the admonishment of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha, who is the wife of the Holy Prophet sallallahu And she said, قُولُوا أَنَّهُ خَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Say he is خَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَلَا تَقُولُوا لَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدَهُ But do not say there is no prophet after him. So she understood this very well that there might be this misconception that خَاتَم might mean last. So she clarified it. Do say he is خَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ But never say he is the last prophet. Because... Is it in the Quran? No, this is not in the Holy Quran. This is a statement of Hazrat Aisha written in Durra Manthur, a book of, in, in the Islamic world. But will this not be contested? You know, you can contest a thing if it goes against many other things. Because this thing that he is the last prophet, as I mentioned on, it, it is against their own belief that Jesus Christ is going to come again. So he's going so to be the last prophet. So are you saying that the prophet Muhammad is not the last of all prophets, as stated in the Quran? The Holy Quran, as I mentioned, never states that he is the last prophet. But what is Khatam Nabin? Khatam Nabin, as I mentioned, it means he is the best of the prophets. And this is the only translation that can reconcile and put in harmony the entire statement. So Allah is saying that Makana Muhammadun Aba Ahadim Rajalikum. Muhammad is not the father of any of you men. Walakin but Walakin Rasulullah, he is the prophet of Allah the Almighty, wa Khatam Nabiyin, and the most excellent of all the prophets. This is the weight that we can give to this verse. Translating it as to mean the last of the prophets does not give any significance to it. When we translate khatam alone, khatam means a stamp, the stamp of attest attestment. So Muhammad وسلم, is that stamp of attestment that testifies to the truthfulness of all the prophets before him. Without the Holy Prophet وسلم, how could you prove to us that Jesus was a prophet of God? It is through the Holy Prophet وسلم, and through that stamp of attestation that we believe, the Muslims believe in Jesus Christ. It is through that stamp. Otherwise, if we leave all this to the biblical narrations, how can, on earth can we reconcile and call Lut as a prophet with all the evil deeds assigned and tasked to him by the Bible? It's not possible for us to call so That's many... That's Lot you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, Lot. That he, he had uh, intimate relations with his wife. So if not for the... Or with his daughter, sorry. So if not for the Holy Prophet وسلم, who through that seal of attestment testified to the truthfulness of those prophets and through his excellence showed us what prophethood is and he became the yardstick of prophethood, you cannot understand what prophethood is. So this is the meaning of Khatam and an Are you saying that to justify the prophethood of Hazrat Mr. Ghulam Ahmed as an Ahmedi? I am not saying so because, you know, Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi, who was a great scholar in the Islamic world and he is very much renowned, he says that well, khatam, when the word khatam comes, yajib an yakuna afdal, it is very important that it means he is the best of that group. And then he continues to say, Ala tara anna rasulana, that do, ni, do you not see that our prophet, lamma kana khatam al nabiyin when he became khatam al nabiyin kana afdal al anbiya he became the best of the prophets not the last of the prophets. So once the door of prophethood has not been closed by Allah the Almighty and has not been closed by the Holy Quran, to take a, a, two words, Khatam and Nabiyin, in the wrong sense, 
not only because you are trying to go against your own theory that Jesus Christ is going to come again, this is what the bone, the bone of contention we have. The prophethood of the promised Messiah السلام, is a different debate and a different question. The question at hand is, do we believe the Holy Prophet is the last prophet? Has Aisha did not believe so. That is why she said that if, do say he is the best of the prophets, Khatam and Nabiyin, but do not, do not say he is the last prophet. So after the Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings of God be upon him. Which other prophets would you say you are aware has come after him? The because Holy... people are waiting for Jesus Christ. The Jews are waiting. Muslims, some Muslims are waiting. People are waiting for the second coming. In the books of Ahadith, it is written, and in Sahih Muslim, the book that is ranked second in the Islamic books of Ahadith, it's written about Isa alayhi salam, who will come again. And for him, it is written that he will be Nabiullah, a prophet of Allah the Almighty. But we need to realize that when we go back to history, there was a time when Elijah's advent was being awaited by the Jews. Mm -hmm. Now, when Jesus Christ came, the Jews opposed him and said, that we are not waiting for Jesus Christ, we are waiting for Elijah. And Jesus Christ tried to explain time and again to them that when a name of a person is being used, it is to show that that person would come in the spirit and power of that person whose name was being used to prophesy. So that is why the Jews did not accept Jesus Christ and said that we are not waiting for you, we are waiting for Elijah. And this is the last message of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, that Elijah would descend in the later days. So when Jesus Christ came, they rejected him, saying, and they made this mistake. And when we read the books of Ahadith, the Holy Prophet mm. warned the Muslims that they would make the, mis the mistake the Jews had made. And very truly, the Holy Prophet did prophesy about a Mahdi and called him Messiah, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. But, but he didn't say a prophet. No, he did say prophet in the book of Muslim, Sahih Muslim. He called Jesus Christ as Nabiullah, a prophet of God who would come in the second advent as well. But for us to say that Jesus Christ of Bani Israel would come again, this is not what the Holy Prophet ﷺ said. He never said the prophet of Bani Israel would come in this ummah because the task of Jesus Christ according to the Holy Quran is wa rasulan ila Bani Israel. Mm -hmm. Jesus has not been sent to the Muslim ummah. He was sent to the people of Moses. So why do you believe in him as a, as a Muslim if he was not sent to you? We do not, we do not believe in him as a prophet of Islam, but we, we believe in him as a prophet sent by Allah, to Allah the Almighty to the Jews. And it's not only him. We have so many prophets. Musa alayhi salam was sent to the Jews. He brought the, so he's the, not a prophet of Islam? He is not a prophet that brought the Sharia of Islam, but he is, he is a prophet that is regarded very highly in Islam. Well... Where does Hazrat Mizar Ghulam Ahmed, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, stand? In this whole quagma of uh, Prophet Muhammad being last prophet, not being last prophet, the explanation as to whether the terminology is right or not, or inferences, where does he stand? So as I mentioned earlier on that the Holy Prophet wasallam did predict and prophesy that Isa ibn Maryam would come in my ummah in the latter days. And... Jesus Christ, who was the Messiah for the Bani Israel, came 1,400 years after Musa alayhi salam. And we were expecting the Mahdi to descend from heavens, as the, the, the non-Muslim, the non-Ahmadis believe. Why? Because of their inference that Jesus Christ went up to heavens alive, which is again not founded in the Holy Quran, but rather it is debunked by the Holy Quran, because this theory it is not in the sunnah of, the, of, the, of Allah the Almighty. So we believe that just as, the, as Jesus Christ came in the power and spirit of Elijah, in the same way the promised Messiah salam, came to do the task what was assigned to Jesus Christ for the ummah, of, for the people of Israel, Bani Israel, the same way a Messiah was to be born in this ummah of the Holy Prophet salam, to reform and revive the Ummah of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and that is why a symb symbolical name of Masih Isa ibn Maryam was given to the promised Messiah alayhi salam. Well, that was Faraz Yasin Rabani, a qualified missionary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and we are coming to you from the Wahhab Adam Studios here in Ghana. Please keep your questions coming through to Africa at mta.tv. 
and you are with your questions. Don't change the dial. Let's move swiftly to the second question for today. And it is from Tanzania. Shall we listen to the question sent via video? Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sa Ali from Tanzania, teacher by profession. My question is, does the wife in Islam have any right over the man of her husband? Well, you heard it for yourself. Husband yeah. and wife. Husband makes money, wife makes money. Finances can bring a lot of troubles in the house. What is the role, the responsibility when it comes to finances of the man over the wife? What is the right that the woman has over the husband's money? You see, Islam is that religion that gives the woman rights that were not given to them by any other religion and by any other society. When you read the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran is very explicit on the rights that have been given to the woman because that, the women were that fiber of the society that were deprived of their rights. So the Holy Quran tells the Muslims that that your treatment of your wives should be very kind. Bil ma'roof means she should be very gentle and very kind. And then the Holy Prophet وسلم, through many admonishments told the believers to take care of their wives. For example, the Holy Prophet said khayrukum khayrukum li ahli, that the best of men is he who is best with his household, with his wife. And then there's another narration that is tawsu bin nisa'i khayra, that your treatment with your wife should be very, very gentle and very, very kind. Now comes the question of the responsibilities the man has to play and the woman has to play. So in the Islamic system of, of, of household, Islam tells the man that he is the breadwinner. He is to provide for the house. And the wife is the housemaker. She is the one who nourishes the house. So there are two roles that go very parallel. The man is supposed to provide for the house and the wife is supposed to make the house. And it's when these two systems come together to play that you get a very harmonious society. Now, let's take for a moment that a family has three kids. Both of them are earning. The wife is earning. The, the husband is earning. In most cases, they will not be spending time at home and the, the house building will not be done right. So Islam puts the responsibility of feeding on the, holy, on the men. The Holy Quran says, النِّسَاءِ That men have been made guardians over their wives. The reason is because they have been assigned the task to spend on them. They have been made those who are to go out and find food and shelter and clothing for the family. But will this not make lots of women lazy and think that they don't have to do any work. They just have to sit, relax, stretch their legs and spend the money of their husbands back in it with what you're saying. As I mentioned earlier on, that there are two different duties assigned. The duty of the lady is equally as important as the duty of the man. So she is not meant to become lazy and she wouldn't become lazy when she knows her responsibilities that she is the housemaker. She has got to make the house a paradise. What if your wife earns more than you? The thing Can you is, decide to be the housemaker and your wife be the earner? The thing is that once somebody goes against the teachings of is the Islamic system, we've seen the community collapsing many times. And I would come back to the question that Islam assigns the man to do the duties the outdoor duties, because the, the faculties that have been bestowed to the man are those taking care of the outside duties. And the wife who has been given tenderness in her heart, the ladies, they've been given tenderness by Allah the Almighty, and their mind is very much well if they are with the children as, con as compared to those. With, if, the, if the men are to take on the responsibility of feeding the children, it would go all wrong compared to women doing that duty. So the man is supposed to provide and the woman is supposed to utilize those resources in the best of the ways. The Holy Quran says, That it is the responsibility of the man to provide for the mother of his children. So Islam has laid 100% emphasis that the responsibility of bringing food in the house, clothing to the house and shelter is a responsibility of the man. But Faraz, are you saying it is wrong for a woman 
to earn more than the husband and provide for the house. In this day and age, we have women with high-flying jobs, and probably the husband may not be as blessed as the woman. Would it be wrong if the woman provides for the house? No, it's not be wrong. If she wishes to provide for the house, that's fine. But the first and foremost responsibility is on the man. So if she is providing for the house, then she is doing a favor upon the man and, help, and playing a helping hand. So it is not her responsibility. So you mean to say she can refuse? Yeah, she can refuse. And let and the whole I mean, family go hungry when she still has money? Will it be fair on the man? The Islamic point of view is that the woman's the money that she earns, the man has no right over that money. But the man is supposed to be the head of the family. He is supposed to be the head of the family because he has some duties to perform. So as long as he is performing those duties, he is the head of the family. He is supposed to provide for them, for their food, for their shelter, for their water. But if the wife, out of her own will, wishes to do this favor upon the man by, helping, by playing a helping hand, that is very much okay. But the, risk, the first and foremost responsibility is on the man. And it is the, the woman has complete rights to ask the man for food, to ask the, the man for shelter, to ask the man for the clothing of herself and her children. Ladies and gentlemen, the woman, the wife, has complete right to ask the husband for food, clothing and shelter, regardless whether she earns more than you, the man. And that, according to Faraz Yasin Rabani, is Islam. So men, let's get up to the task. Please keep your questions coming through to Africa at mta.tv. Let's move swiftly to Tanzania, no Uganda rather. We've, we've taken Tanzania and Ghana. Let's go to Uganda and, and listen to uh, what question they have for us for the next five minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Tahir Ahmad Drami from the Gambia. My question is, why is interest forbidden in Islam? That question was from the Gambia. I mistakenly took it for Uganda, but I understand it's from the Gambia. But the import of the question is, why is interest forbidden in Islam? What do you classify as interest? First of all, I would like to mention that interest is not only forbidden by Islam. When we read the books of other religions, we find that interest has also been condemned and prohibited, especially by the Bible. When we talk about interest, interest means to lend someone money and asking for an additional amount of, of sum of money when he is returning that money back. But is that not profit? That's not profit, and I would explain why it is the cause of the collapse the world is facing. We, see have, we have this both migrants, we have the global warming, we have the meddling of other countries in the affairs of other countries, foreign policy making. We have so many issues that the world is facing currently, so many crises. And when you go to the core of this, you would realize that the current banking module and interest is the reason behind all this. This might sound very strange how both migrants and financial policies are all because of interest. But I will explain this. The Holy Quran says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O those, O ye who believe, Ittaqullah, fear Allah the Almighty, wadaru ma baqiya min al-riba, and give up interest, what's remain, meaning give, put a halt to this, in kuntum mu'minin, if you are believers. Fa illam taf'alu, and if you do not stop this practice of uh, interest, fa adhanu bi harb min Allah wa rasooli, then get ready to wage a war with Allah the Almighty and His Prophet. So this is a very metaphorical way of saying that if you do not give up interest, you are waging war against the system Allah has put in place. But for us, come to think of it, someone has his money, probably he's going to use it for business, and then the other person comes for that money. <laughs> the business would have generated profit. So why is it wrong to have interest? Yeah, let is me it not the profit? Let me explain this. And as I'm explaining this, I will be taking it from a, vi a very wide uh, spectrum. Because, In a minute. Yeah. Now, the thing is, let me give you an example, that this country, the bank has, let's say, $10,000. And in the beginning of the fiscal year, the bank has decided that it is giving that out with 30% interest. 
So the country has $10,000, and at the end of the year, you are supposed to return that money, the society is supposed to return that money with 30% interest. So at the end of the year, you are supposed to return $13,000. Now comes the question that the total money in the country was $10,000. So where are you going to produce that $3,000 from? The society does not have the right to print money. So the system that the banks were playing, they had $10,000. And in the beginning of the fiscal year, they have given that out with 30% interest. So you can produce another planet Earth, but you cannot produce that $3,000 because you are not permitted to do so. Then what happens? Well, but the governments are permitted to, I mean, make their own money. Yes. Now, when the government or the banking systems are going to make their money, it's not going to come free of charge. They will print the money again and will give you the money to repay your loan. So you are taking money on interest to repay your loan. And this is why we have foreign policy. When the uh, rich countries, they give money to the poor countries, they do so with interest. So at the end of the time, they will give you another loan to pay off the previous debt because you are trying to pay off the unpayable. You, you don't, that money does not exist. They will produce another amount of money with strings attached. They will privatize all your national assets and they will interfere in your policies and they would tell you do this and do not do this and only then will we give you the second amount of money to repay the first debt and this is coming with another interest what if someone borrows the other money let's say ten thousand of any kind of currency and then the person comes back and says this is your ten thousand but thank you another extra thousand is that not acceptable in Islam? That is very much acceptable, as long as it does not come with conditions. If it is coming with conditions that you must pay this amount of money, that is where the problem comes. Now, I would like to return again to that question because it's very pertinent. Now, you see, when a person goes to the bank to get a loan, they look at the person, that can this person repay this amount of loan? Now, what happens here is, they take in security your assets, your car, your house, your bungalow, your business. So at the end of the year, if you're not able to pay off this amount of money, we would take, off, take your property. And what happens now is that that person who has taken the loan is a rich person. The poor man goes and they tell you that, sorry, we cannot give you this money because your state doesn't, if in case you're not able to pay off that money and the interest, we, we are not winning. Meanwhile, they are still winning. Now, what happens here is, that the rich man goes, he takes the loan, at the end of the year, he pays that money with the interest, the bank wins because they've got profits. At the end of the year, they do not, the man is not able to pay back the loan. They still win because they take your assets. So well, what happens here is that the, richer, the rich becomes richer and the poor man who indeed needs an investment in his business is not going to get investment because of the current financial module. Well. That's all time will permit us to dissect into these questions and bring to you the answers according to the Islamic uh, theology and knowledge. This is your questions. Please keep your questions coming through to Africa at mta.tv and I remain your host, Ibrahim K. Asante. Thank you and make a date with us once again.